Hey, I want to introduce you to someone really special. This is Nicole Lewis with me today, who is the artist and owner of Art to the Extreme, the home of the original Rainbow Crayon, which if you haven't seen, they're the perfect gift. Don't go look now, you can go look after this video, but they're colorful, personalized name crayons. And Nicole makes a lot of other different crayon products as well. And Nicole and I met many years ago at a conference and she's just an incredible business owner. I've been following her journey over the years. We're Facebook friends. And I asked her to come on here to share her experience with getting featured in places like People Magazine, Forbes, Real Simple, Country Living, Red Book, The Drew Barrymore Show, Magnolia Journal, Good Housekeeping. The list keeps going on. Nicole has even worked with celebrities. I mean, we could sit here for just an entire hour talking about all the places Nicole's <laughs> been featured in. So I am really excited to dive deep with Nicole today. Thank you so much for being here. I am so happy to be here and you can already tell I'm getting giddy as you talk about that because I am so passionate about this. I'm very much of a, if I can do it, you can do it too type of person. So I'm so excited to share some juicy, awesome things today with you all. I am so excited. And I, I, that's one of my philosophies too. I believe anything can be teachable. Anything can be learned and taught. So, okay. I want to start with the basics. Let's start from the very beginning. Tell me more about what life and what your business was like when you first started your shop. Oh my goodness. I love talking about this because I feel like everybody has such a different story, but sometimes it starts off in very much the same way. So I was a teacher. I was an elementary art teacher for 10 years uh, before I decided to quit my day job and go all in and run art to the extreme, my company full time. But I was an elementary art teacher. This is back like 2005, 2006, and fresh out of college. At the same time, Etsy.com was brand new. It was a brand new platform. There were like less than a thousand people on it. We all knew each other by name. Um, I actually found Etsy because I was homesick from school. Being a first year art teacher, I taught at two schools. One of those schools, I was on an art cart pretty much my entire time as a teacher, but um, I would push a cart from classroom to classroom. And I noticed there were so many broken nubs and stubs of crayons all over the ground. And I was like, okay, you know, Earth Day's coming up. I'm teaching a unit on texture, these kindergartners. Let's pick them up. Let's make something with them. And I remember melting down crayons with my mom when I was little, like little wax Dixie cups. And I did the same with my students for this texture unit. And it was so horribly awesome, but it worked. I thought, you know, there has to be a better way. And at the time, Etsy.com was new. I actually was homesick from school and my mom told me about it. And I was like, you know what, let's try it. So I, I just listed a few things and everything from like these little like tooth pillow pouches that my mother-in-law made to ceramics, scarves. I listed some of the crayons that I had made in the wax Dixie cups because silicone molds weren't around at that time. Um, it was such a fun community. It was really small. It was something I was doing as a side hustle. Um, we all knew each other. We traded Christmas gifts. Um, at the end of the year and it just kind of started as this fun hobby and moved into a side hustle and then when my first son was born I was like you know what let's let's quit let's focus just on crayons and let's see where that goes so that's kind of like a little bit about that kind of start but what I like best about what I'm doing is the customization because early in my journey I had students that couldn't even hold a standard crayon. Mm. Um, they would, a couple of my students with special needs, they would hold it. I mean, crayons, I'm an adult. I call her, I snap crayons easily. When I go to a restaurant, I swear they're broken before I even leave, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I had, I had students with special needs that could not hold a standard crayon. And I was taking their hands, gripping them in clay and casting molds. So they would have something that accommodates for them to be able to hold it in color. And that's kind of also where that spark came from to get that customized art supply that solved problems in my own classroom. Holy cow. I never knew that that beginning origin story of your business. That is, that's really heartwarming. And you were, how long were you teaching? Well, okay. Okay. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So 
at the time you start your Etsy shop. I love that your mom introduced you to it. And what were you doing to get traffic and sales to your shop? Um, to be honest, absolutely nothing. <laughs> at the time when I first started, there was no such thing as branding and running ads on like, this is pre Pinterest. This is pre Instagram. This is like Facebook people still in college mm. era. So mm. none of that really existed. And, you know, even the blogger world was just taking off. And that's more of talking about like blogspot.com and, and not like anything like it is today. So I was doing nothing to get traffic. Um, I didn't even see it as this full-fledged business that I had to rely on to bring an income at the time. And I was like, you know, there has to be a way to do something and not have to spend money to get that traffic. That's kind of where you came in a little bit, actually. Yeah, so that's a good segue to my next question because, I mean, you do so many incredible things with your business. You even teach and consult on those things. But today, we want to. I wanted to focus more on the influence and marketing portion because you do, in my opinion, you do that incredibly well. And so public relations, media outreach, influence and marketing, in my opinion, they're all kind of one and the same thing. And that really helped transform your business. Tell me how you got started with that. So what kind of sparked the idea for even trying to do that or getting media? Honestly, it was, I saw one of your presentations. You were at speaking at the conference, which is so funny. I don't even know if that's what you were expecting the answer to be. Um, but you were a presenter at one of the conferences and you were talking about how you got your necklaces into magazines. And this is really before a lot of magazines were online or anything. So I was like, I, I wanted to get that print copy of something. I wanted to be able to be in a magazine too. And your presentation just lit a little spark under me and I just like took it into this crazy blazing fire and it turned out so good. <laughs> but yeah, you were kind of really the spark of the fact that you were like, oh, so-and-so in this TV show was wearing my necklace. I'm like, all right, so how can I get crayons and it's on like a table in the background of a TV show? You know, they don't have to show them or talk about, you know, how can it just be there so I can use that as content and be like, hey, my crayons were on a TV show. And so that was one avenue. I was like, okay, how do I get my crayons into a photo shoot in a magazine? Let's start looking through the magazine and seeing who the photo director is, who the props director is and things like that. So, and I mean, this is 10, 12 years ago or so at least. And this is before coaches or anything even existed. And I know you have your own awesome, amazing group. You were doing this before this was even a thing either. So it's fun to see kind of your journey through all of this too. And what I find incredible too, is because I, I harp on influencer marketing all the time. That's the one thing I always tell people, like if there's one thing you can do, if there's one thing I wish for anyone to do, it's to learn how to do influencer marketing and really do it well. But there's a lot of, I think, roadblocks around it. There's a lot of fear and it is scary. And it is, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be, it's, it, it feels like this huge mountain that you don't know how to get across, but you just took it and you ran with it. You ran really far with it. So I wanted to learn from you with everything that you've been doing. So tell me more about your pitching workflow. So what are the steps involved for you? Like, you know, is there, I, I don't want to put any words in your mouth. So tell me how, what, how, what that process looks like to you. I'll kind of fast forward from when I met you a little bit and I was like, okay, so how do I, how do I start finding people to even pitch to? So I was doing a lot of Googling. I was literally looking up in magazines who wrote the stories and trying to find their emails. And I was like, I can't find their emails online anywhere. Where can I find these? And once again, this is way before that there were services and coaches and websites you could pay into, but there was one and I'm not one to just kind of like blindly dive into something I don't know that's going to deliver or not because I have no budget. Like I've never spent a dime in advertising. So I want to repeat that again. I've never spent a dime in advertising, no Facebook ads, no nothing. I have done like one of the, I think you Twitter on the Facebook ads for me like a long time ago. and. Some of that was like free ad credit stuff, but I've never paid for advertising. I've solely done this by connecting, finding people, connecting. What can I do for you? How can I serve you? And building upon those relationships. 
So um, I did wind up using one service that had like a database. And I cringe when I say that because now there's so many like media lists that you can pay for and stuff. And it's not necessarily a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. But this one was called Launch Grow Joy. And I can't remember if you even used that or suggested it. Um, But I found that and I looked through all the resources and it was trustable. I, I, I found actual pitches. I found actual emails of people and I worked my way from there. And I maybe pitched 10 people the first time. And I mean, this is like 10, 12 years ago now. And like all but two said yes. And now that doesn't always happen. But at the time I had, and I still do have a product that, well, back then nobody else was making like all good things. Now, you know, there's tons of stuff on Pinterest and you see crayon makers left and right. But what I do differently and go above and beyond is I have built this brand up my photography, my media. I am the one that people want to come to for these products because I'm the OG. And if you're not one that cares about the OG, well, here are all the different things I'm in for that social proof. Why do you want to be in magazines? You want to be in physical magazines for that social proof that gives you content to show like, hey, here's me in Magnolia magazine type of thing. Now, does that lead to sales? I tell people, how many people are actually tearing out a page in the magazine, typing in on their computer or phone, www.art2theextreme.com, and then buying? No. I tell people print magazine is like the kind of bragging rights. You get to show it off. You get to create content for it. You get to film yourself walking in a Target, getting your magazine off the stands. But what you want is online articles as well, because that's where the clicks and the features of things come to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is, what does your process look like now? So Lunch Grow Joy, like the OG, in my opinion, of Media List, Andre Ayers is amazing. She was who I originally learned how to do PR from, actually. So that's great that we both found our way to her at some point in different parts of our journeys. Um, so do you still use Media Lists or do you do your own research now for your own contacts? I I know enough now and I've been on this journey enough that I know where to find the right things. But there are times like I usually will subscribe to media list actually in June because June is when all the June, July is when all of the holiday planning is happening. So in the months leading up to that, I'm reconnecting with past editors I've worked with. I'm reaching out to like, I usually pick one or two people on Instagram that I really would like to connect with over the holidays and have them maybe feature some of my products or show them off in their gift guides that I know gets a lot of eyeball traffic on. So building those relationships ahead of time, commenting on their stuff, um, sending them samples if they're willing to receive samples is great, but not just cold coming out and be like, Hey, will you come feature these awesome cans? You have to really make sure that you're warming up your audience, be it your actual audience or your customers, um, some members of the media or influencers. You need to make sure that you are digging in and taking the time to read articles that these members of the media are writing, referring to them in some of your pitches. Hey, I really loved your article about X, Y, and Z. This is what I do and how it like you can somehow tie that into your pitches and make it more personable because when you're emailing, when you're pitching, when you're talking to these members in the media, they're getting thousands of emails in their inbox a day. So you need to do something that stands out. So I'm building my relationships a couple months ahead of time or re kind of establishing my relationships with these people. If it's been a while in June, July, I'm resubscribing. I, what I like about the launch grow joy is that you can pay monthly and then stop. It's not like a year service if you don't want it to be. And for people that like me, that I don't want to have a million programs, a million subscriptions and stuff. I just need that information. I need to dive in. And that holds me responsible for getting that done in those two months, those three months that I pay for that service too. But really going in, making a list of who I'm pitching, when these pitches are due. If you are wanting magazine features, they're almost solidifying and done with the magazine by end of July and moving on to the next issue. So summer, I'm mainly working on in print. And then August, September, October, I'm working on online pitches. So like those BuzzFeed articles, those, you know, like 
features on like Forbes and entrepreneur and things like that too. So I'm kind of hitting it at different angles. Okay. And we're talking about getting those features in time for the holiday season, right? For fourth quarter. Yes. yes. Awesome. And I say holiday season for me because I make 90% of my income in October, November, and December. I bank a lot on holiday season. And I would say a lot on gift guides and placements too, because those are backlinks to your site. Everything, everything interconnects because the more backlinks you have to your website, the more sales you're going to get, the more that Google will see that you're a trusted website and move you up in that rankability and that list on Google when somebody searches for your types of presence and things. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing a few things <laughs> that I felt like I was never super good at was that consistency in building those relationships and keeping in touch with editors. So what I'm hearing from what you're saying is that you are very conscious of who you're choosing to build that relationship with. So am, am I right to assume that you don't have necessarily a humongous list of contacts that you reach out to, but it's a more specially chosen few that you like to reach out to? I do have specially chosen few I do like to reach out to. I am now familiar enough with the publications that do value small business mm. features and relationships too, because that's important. What's changed now in 2023 versus three or four years ago is members of the media, they're constantly changing publications. They're constantly yeah. getting laid off. They have to also make their money through affiliate links. I don't subscribe to an affiliate program. So I'm not on like affiliate lead or a lot of them need like skin links. A lot of times people say you must be on Amazon, which I'm not. You must be in Target or Walmart, Amazon or have a skin link. I don't, but this is where Etsy comes into play because I have my own website, but I still thrive on Etsy. Etsy is still like, I would say 80, 90, 80, 85% of my income over the holidays. But Etsy is wonderful because they have their own affiliate program that members of the media trust. They go through, I think it's called AWIN. But if I give somebody an Etsy link, as much as I don't want them to use my Etsy link because I want them to come to my website, it kills me each time. But I know that when I'm pitching and they want affiliates, that I have to use my Etsy site because they're going to get money, not from me, but from Etsy every time that somebody clicks on my, my very visual photo. Editors love good photos. You have to have good photos. Very visual, very appealing, giftable photo. And any purchases they make on Etsy after that, that the writer gets that credit back. So that's a big draw to use Etsy because it's a free affiliate program for myself. So I'm not paying monthly. That makes a lot of sense because I don't use one either, but that is a common question people have is reaching out to influencers, reaching out to the media, like is how does affiliate marketing play into that? So that's really helpful to hear your experience with it. Another thing I'm keying on to with your process is that Am I right to also assume that you don't necessarily do pitching every single day, every single week of the year? You're choosing just a few months out of the year to focus on it. I am because I am someone that can easily get overwhelmed. I'm like looking over here and I'm like, oh, squirrel. <laughs> so to keep me on track, I really focus June, July, and August, which happens to be my slowest month anyway, on that networking, on that building, on, you know, like, hey, can I work with this big company to do something during the holidays or a little before? I'm making my plans in the summer because I'm also behind the scenes revving up making thousands and thousands of crayons, like these, these little letter crayons by day storing them, but I also need to be doing things behind the scene to continue working for me and what's going to move the needle for me behind the scenes. Now for other people, maybe your time is Easter or Valentine's Day. And then that means you need to be starting with stuff in October, November. I, I have very giftable things for Easter and Valentine's Day, but I'm in the thick of my business. So I'm still one of the main people in it, making it, selling it, shipping it and stuff still, which is a whole nother chat for another day. But there are different times of the year, depending on what you do, that that's going to be your main time that you need to focus on pitching for hopefully to be featured months down the line. Okay. That's music to my ears because that being consistent thing is, it doesn't 
doesn't work for me either. It's like, I work best in spurts and in campaigns and projects. But if you tell me I got to show up every day to do the social media thing, I'm like, oh no, <laughs> bye. <laughs> so that's very nice to know. Uh, okay. Tell us about what your business is like now. I, um, if you're comfortable with sharing sales numbers or crayon numbers or what have you, just for us to get a picture of truly how all of this has really impacted your business. So you start it with your Etsy shop. You're selling a few things here and there. You were still a full-time teacher and now you're, you're not right. So tell us more about no. what that all looks like. Yeah. So I quit my day job in 2014 when my first son was born and um, focused my Etsy shop on just crayons because I had a bunch of random stuff like everybody else did back then. Like I said before, there was no branding. It was like mom and pop garage sale of craft items. And that's just the way it was back then. Um, But I decided I did one in-person show where I decided I was only going to bring my crayons. I wasn't going to bring up like pottery. I wasn't going to bring any. And I sold double the inventory. I think I made like $600 that time. And this is a long time ago. I made like $600 instead of like $300. And I was like, okay, I, I sold out of my crayons. I made this. Let's let's up my prices just a little bit and let's bring double. And the next few shows after that in like 2015, 2016, I was making over $1,000 a show, which... For me, it was amazing, especially for like a five to eight hour show. Um, I was like, okay, let's do this online. Let's let's just do crayons online. And so I maybe only had 10 products or so. And the photography was still pretty horrid. Um, I there Some of these Facebook groups still exist, but I joined one of those Facebook groups that's like, give your product and a photographer will take your photos for you in, in exchange. And those are wonderful. I just the worlds combined. And I was just so fortunate to meet my photographer. Her name is Kiana K photography. And at a time where I didn't have a budget, I didn't pay a photographer. She took my products. She took the most amazing photos. And if you've ever been to my website, pretty much every single photo, they're stunning and they're so eye catching. And that's what helps my products stand out in magazines online. Um, but photography is a huge thing. And once I realized photography needed to play a role, that was one of the first. And I think I was about at the time I was also working with you a little bit with Instagram because Instagram kind of came out and I was trying to build that up. So I think photography was my first thing I actually paid a service for and then had a little bit of help with you with Instagram behind the scenes because I had no clue what I was doing on Instagram either. Those were like the first things I paid for. And that really started to help pick things up a bit. Okay. And when we're talking about your holiday season, because I always love seeing those pictures of you where you're like 2 a.m. packing orders and you're like in the sea of packages. <laughs> it's incredible. And I'm I'm so happy for you. And I love seeing your journey. So what would you say to someone who is scared to start pitching? Why are you scared? Don't be scared. Scared. What is the worst that someone's going to say? The worst thing maybe that someone's going to say is no, because hopefully people aren't outright rude to you and just be like, I hate your stuff. It's ugly or something. The worst thing they're going to say is no. And I tell people, and I've heard this before, you know, a no is not a no is not a no forever. A no is just, just right now. It wasn't the right fit. And most of the time, especially if you're pitching or reaching out to somebody, they probably didn't even see your pitch for multiple reasons, honestly, for multiple reasons. So if you don't hear crickets, just assume that they might've passed your stuff along or filed it away for later, which has actually happened before. I've pitched editors and I would get no replies and I would follow up. I usually follow up two or three times giving a week or so in between before I would send them a new pitch eventually, a different type of angle. But I've two or three times I can remember and one definitely leading to a magazine feature. I pitched someone and they said, oh, this was actually forwarded to me from so-and-so. Or I searched my email inbox for a holiday gift guide and remembered that your stuff came up. So I'm very strategic with the words that I use in my when I email the subject line of my emails because I want them to be able to, if they're searching for a kid's product for holiday gift guide and they're searching in their inbox, I want that to be able to come up if they come back to it later. But the worst thing someone's going to do, honestly, is say no. And it's it could be a very short, quick no with no reason. And that's what it's going to be because they have to get through all these emails. Do not take it personally. 
try again with a different pitch. It doesn't mean you can't pitch him again for something else, a different idea later too. So you don't know until you try and you get better. I mean, I didn't have the perfect pitches the first time. And I mean, I think 10 years ago, I didn't have enough, as much competition as today, but try it. There's, there's no, what if they say no, it's not going to hurt you. It's okay. Move on. Like you can do it. Seriously. If I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> 